That on BBC One, everyone's favourite star, Patrick Moore, delves deep into the night sky. Good evening. For the past year, an unusual collection of astronomical photographs had been touring the museums and science centres of Great Britain and Australia. The Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff over here, in Australia to Melbourne, Perth, Sydney and so on. And uh, currently it's at the Science Museum in London, and going on from there to South End and then to Hurstmonceur Castle in Sussex. It's the work of Dr. David Malin, the astronomer and photographer at the Anglo-Australian Observatory in New South Wales. Of course, we featured David's pictures many times, but mainly in their scientific context. These are rather different, aimed at a different audience, and they've been described as works of art. David, how did this exhibition come to be? Patrick, we've been trying to have these pictures seen by wider audiences for a very long time. I do quite a bit of public speaking, but mainly these audiences are self-selected. They're people who are interested in, in astronomy. What I was wanting to do was to show these pictures to people who wouldn't cross the road to hear an astronomical talk. The opportunity arose when the British Council, who are a British cultural organisation represented in 100 countries uh, around the world, were celebrating 50 years of their presence in Sydney. And they were looking around for very good Anglo-Australian collaborations. And they came across the Anglo-Australian Observatory, which of course is such a good collaboration. They found our pictures and they sponsored two exhibitions travelling, as you said, in the two countries over the, over the past year. Uh, they've been extraordinarily successful and they've uh, shown our pictures to people who would never normally see such images and the response has been wonderful. The really surprising thing is that people look at these photographs as images, not as astronomical pictures. And, and they, they ask questions about them, what is it, what is there? And of course that gives one the opportunity to say, well here, here is a place where stars are forming or some galaxies are colliding. Uh, people are astonished about this because they don't expect this kind of response to images that have this kind of innocuous feel to them. But the images are also very, very restful uh, in, in the sense that you can look at them and they are, they are, they're just sublime in a sense because they're out of this world in the most remarkable way. And uh, the, the fact that they are millions of light years away is also very impressive to most people. Do you see them then as works of art? It's really not for me to say that they're, they're, they're works of art. Uh, other people say uh, that, that indeed they are. The pictures themselves, of course, are cosmic landscapes. They are, they are parts of the universe that we normally never see. Therefore, we need big telescopes and special techniques to, uh, to see them. But of course, you can take pictures with ordinary cameras. There are pictures, for instance, of the North and South Celestial Pole, which look remarkably alike when you compare them side by side. But of course, those who live in the North and South see them as very different places indeed. David, these pictures are coloured. Are these colours real? Yes, the colours are, are exactly real. In fact, I take a great deal of effort to make the colours precise. Um, the reason that we don't see them, of course, is that the human eye is very poor at seeing colour when light levels are low, even with a very big telescope. So photography has to be used to extract the colours and make them, make them visible. Even the colours of uh, subtle stars, as in parts of the Milky Way, looking towards the centre of our, our Milky Way, are so subtle that we can't see them, but they appear yellowish on our, on our colour photographs. But David, these are photographs made from conventional photographic plates. Is there any future in electronic astrophotography? Oh, the future is in, 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 in electronic astronomical photography. Uh, photography has done a, a, a wonderful job using conventional silver halide techniques. But uh, electronics are, are the way ahead. Electronics offer you the possibility of making quantitative measurements, for instance, of, your, uh, uh, of the images. And CCDs, charge couple devices, are much more sensitive than the photographic plate. What they lack is area. Um, a CCD is about as big as a postage stamp, but a photographic plate can be uh, enormous. Uh, and so there are horses for courses here. But the way ahead is certainly using electronics. Well, let's have a look at some more of the pictures, can we? Yes, indeed. Um, we have some wonderful images here of parts of Orion. Um, uh, stars, gas and dust illuminated and producing beautiful blue and red colours. And also uh, the black and white photographs too uh, have got a lot of interest uh, around the star uh, in stars in Ophiuchus and it's got lots of structure in it which you can bring out in black and white in a way that you can't bring out uh, in colour. What about this one? NGC 
3293. Yes, this is a cluster of stars sitting there uh, on the sky. It's very much like the jewel box, uh, Kappa Crucis, alongside, uh, alongside the Southern Cross. But this is a very young cluster, a few tens of millions of years old. Much older is Trumpler 5, yes. which, uh, where all the hot, bright stars have disappeared, and we're left with a few ancient stars sitting on the sky. Much older still, of course, are the globular clusters, uh, and these are beautiful in the Southern Hemisphere. Back back first, the two best. 47 to you can't eat, see here, yes. and Omega Centauri are so far south we can't see them at all from Britain. Well, we can see them with a the naked eye in Australia, and we can see them as fuzzy blobs. In fact, when, when Halley's Comet was drifting through the southern Milky Way, uh, we got phone calls about, about there being another comet, because uh, uh, Omega Sen just looks like a, like a comet too. I was there and I saw eye. it. Now, the interesting thing here, look at these pictures, you can see stars almost to the centre of the globular. Yes, indeed. Well, we have a good telescope. A four-metre telescope in good conditions will resolve these globular clusters right to the centre. Just imagine living on a planet, going the star in the middle of Omega Centauri. Oh, you wouldn't see anything, of no, you course. Wouldn't you wouldn't see the, uh, the wider universe at all. Well, let's come back now to a gaseous nebula, and the famous, famous of all, M42, the sword of Orion, this marvellous picture you took. This is my favourite picture, I have to say, and it's my favourite for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's technically challenging to make it at all, but secondly, it shows things that can't be seen on black and white photographs. You can see differentiation of the colour and the gas around the star-forming region, which shows just how the star-forming region works. And that's difficult information to get your hand on looking at, uh, at black and white photographs. Also in Oran, the famous Horse's Head Dark Nebula, a lovely photograph. It's amazingly difficult to see visually. I've often tried with my big telescope. Well, I've never seen it with the Anglo-Australian telescope, which is, a, which is a huge telescope. It just has a too low a surface brightness. But this is a cloud of dust illuminated by some bright stars nearby, and the dust has been destroyed by this starlight, and the gas flashes off, produces a brilliant red colour, against which we see the silhouette of the Horsehead Nebula itself. And behind it, those strange areas, aren't there? Yes, um, another black and white photograph, which has been a great success in this exhibition, people have asked for copies of this more than any other, is this kind of waterfall, which shows gas flashing off from the surface of a dark molecular cloud, illuminated by starlight, producing this, this lovely wispy uh, feeling and lumpiness. Uh, uh, it looks like a, a cosmic waterfall, but in fact it's exactly the reverse. The water, the mm. spray, is coming from the lumpy rocks below, which are the surface of a dark cloud. But there are dust clouds, many of them are there. Look at this one. Yes, this is in, in Scorpius. Uh, this hasn't got a catalogue name at all. I spotted it on one of our sky survey plates and it looked very interesting indeed. I could see it had some colour because I was able to compare uh, black and white pictures yes. taken in red and yeah. blue light. It looked obviously very coloured. And with the Anglo-Australian telescope, it turned out to be a very spectacular object indeed. Uh, this is another example where starlight is etching away the surface of a cloud of dark gas and dust. And then some that look extraordinary like comets. This is the cometary globule, isn't it? Well, it is. Um, the, they have nothing much to do with comets. I mean, these are huge clouds of gas. This one weighs uh, uh, several hundred times the mass of the sun. A and if that's all that was there, that's all you would see. You'd see yeah. just a dark hole in space. Yeah. But nearby, there's a group of, of bright stars. They're illuminating it and blowing off the long bluish tail you see uh, leaving the edge of the object. Again, slowly etching it away. Extraordinary thing. And this one, NGC 6188. Beautiful, tranquil part of uh, uh, the constellation of Ara uh, in the deep southern sky. Yes. A few stars, lots of dust, and this pinkish red hydrogen nebula, which is so typical of the places where stars are being formed. But some of these gaseous nebulae are truly amazing. I mean, the Trifid Nebula as well, and I love this picture of it. It's, it's a very popular image. Um, you can see this with the unaided eye as well. From the, in the southern winter, look at the Milky Way stretched across the sky. You can see the Lagoon Nebula and next to it the, the Trifid or Trifid Nebula. Yes, I mean, it's chopped into three. When you look at it through a telescope with the, with the eye, you can see three sections of it. But on this colour photograph, you see the blue reflection around the star-forming region and the vivid red I I in the middle. It makes a truly spectacular image. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, when you think of a planetary nebula, you think of M57, the Ring Nebula of Enlada. I think on the whole, the Helix Nebula is more spectacular. Oh, we've got a beauty, yes. The Helix Nebula is fantastic. It's about as big as the full moon on the sky. It is mm. absolutely huge. And with and a really dark sky with binoculars, you can actually see it. But of course, what it is, is the remnants of a sun-like star, which has lost its outer layer, it's come to the end of its useful life, and it's thrown off its outer surface. And the helix is the expanding shell of that material, illuminated by the nuclear reactor core in the centre, that was the centre of the star, at enormous temperature, and it glows beautifully with the colours which tell us what the thing is made of. You know, more than ten years ago, 1987, a supernova flared up in the large cloud of Magellan. I actually flew down to South Africa to have a look at it. And now this amazing picture here shows what's happened since then. This is probably the most complicated picture I've ever taken because it reveals the light echo of the supernova, which uh, 
A supernova, of course, is like a flash of yes, light, indeed. very brief flash. The death of, a, death of a massive star. Yes, it, uh, it lives for about a year and then fades away. And this pulse of light travels outwards through, through the galaxy, through the, Milky, through the Magellanic Clouds in this case. Uh, and that flash of light bumps into dust and gas between the stars. And some of the light gets deflected to us, but the path length is longer, so we see it afterwards. It's therefore a light echo. And to reveal this kind of thing, you need photographs taken before and after the supernova exploded, and you subtract the two. And the difference between them is this ring of nebulosity you see on the sky, which actually reflects the true colour of the supernova when it was brightest in about May 1987. It relates to magnitude too. I remember seeing it then. Of course, we couldn't see it from here at all. You know, it's amazing how much we in Britain miss. I mean, we miss the whole of the Centaur, as for example, Centaur A. Yes, yeah, Centaurus A is a fantastic radio galaxy, um, a subject for in intensive study for us in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the nearest, strongest radio source to us. It's full of detail optically as well. In fact, in this photograph, you can just pick out a green star, which is itself a supernova. Uh, it was spotted by Bob Evans, who lives in New South Wales, Indeed, who I, yes. I, I think you know very well. I and I photographed it a few days after he discovered the supernova. Um, but I was only able to take the blue and the green plates that night. Then it clouded over, oh. and it was uh, over a year before I was able to take the red light plates, by which time the supernova had faded away. So on the colour picture, we have this curious greenish star. The supernova itself was actually a bright yellow colour. It's just that I didn't get the red light exposure on the same night. Uh, the, the galaxy has got so much structure that we can manipulate the images in special ways to reveal even more detail. And this is an unsharp, masked version of... Uh, uh, Centaurus A, which shows lots and lots of structure in the dust lane, star-forming regions and so on that you can't normally see. And here's a very different system, M87, the giant galaxy, more than 50 million light years away. Yes, this is a beautiful object uh, in Virgo. It's got thousands of billions of stars in it. It's very ancient. It, n it no longer makes stars. But at its centre is a black hole. Uh, and that black hole is a, is a source of X-rays, radio rays uh, and all the rest. And there's a, an enormous jet sticking out of it, which can, you can see especially well in, in ultraviolet light. I think, though, we've got to agree that the, the most beautiful galaxies are the spirals, NGC 2997. Yes, we believe this to be very much like our, our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we're surrounded by blue stars, um, although, you can't, although you can't see the colour when you step outside at night. The stars that make up the constellations are a population of young stars. They're mostly blue. And the, and the blue spiral arms of this galaxy are that same population seen in an external galaxy that we believe to be very much like our Milky Way. Well, that one is not in Messier's catalogue, the famous 781 catalogue, but, but this one is M83. Yes, uh, NGC 2997 was too far south for Messier. M83, of course, is also a long way south. I'm really surprised that Messier saw it at all. It's not that bright when you look at it, no, it through, through, through a telescope, but he saw it. Uh, and this is a most spectacular, symmetrical uh, galaxy. I've been recently working on, um, on some other images of, uh, uh, of this object, which show it to be much bigger than you can see on this photograph. But this photograph shows you all of the things you would expect to see in a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. Pink star-forming regions, dark arcs of dust where stars are actually forming now, and a yellowish nucleus corresponding to the vast star clouds we see in our own galaxy in Sagittarius, a uh, kind of haze, a faint haze, around the centre of the galaxy. All galaxies are different. This one's different again, 3628. Ah, yes, this is a, a spiral galaxy seen almost edge on. And we believe this is to be very much like our Milky Way. Spiral galaxies seen edge on, uh, you would expect it to be symmetrical. But this one's got sort of yes. fluffed up ends to it. And we know this galaxy is interacting with two companions. They're all in orbit, or one around the other. Just like our own Milky Way is, we have the Magellanic yes, yes. Clouds, of course. They, too, will be affecting our galaxy, stirring it up and causing it to make stars in unexpected places. Another one, 1365. Ah, oh, 1365, what a beauty, yes. This is uh, the archetypal barred spiral galaxy. Yes, indeed. The stars around the centre of galaxies tend to form these hazy yellow nuclei, but sometimes the galaxies are so massive that they're unstable if that happens, and they produce these elongated bars with curved arcs of stars coming off uh, either end. 1365 in the constellation of Fornax in the far southern sky is a beautiful example of this. Well, I've got two more, 5078, what about this one? Oh, this is a very unusual galaxy. It's not widely known, uh, but it's an elliptical galaxy with a, a dust lane across it. 
you notice the dust lane is slightly askew and there is structure in it. And just underneath the galaxy, there's another spiral looking system. Now these two are interacting and maybe have interacted before. And it could be that the dust lane we see arose from what we now see as a spiral galaxy at some previous interaction. Because galaxies do exchange material when they, when they, when they get together. And uh, the larger galaxy absorbs the dust, produces the dust lane around it, and the stripped spiral drifts away. And we see it on the bottom part of the picture there. And finally, one amazing galaxy known as the Sombrero Hat Galaxy. <laughs> I don't understand why. Well, it's a terrific shape, isn't it? It's a beautiful, ins inspirational object. In fact, in, in the photographic exhibitions that we were talking about before, this is presented as a two by three metre print on the wall. And when it's well lit, it looks absolutely spectacular. It's, of course, a spiral galaxy, but its central bulge is enormous. If we lived in this galaxy, the Milky Way would fill two-thirds of the sky all the, all the time, and we'd see hardly any of the external universe. Well, these are... <laughs> they look like close-ups, don't they? Now, see, I think everyone's fascinated by these. Which one on the whole are the most popular? Oh, it, it has to be M42. Um, it's the nearest star-forming region to us. It's quite spectacular. You can see it with the unaided eye. But when, when you use uh, a big telescope to make pictures of this sort, you see unexpected detail and colour in it. It's very, very rich indeed. It produces the biggest response from the public. What about the new two-degree field technique? Ah, yes. Well, the, the two-degree field is now working very well. What the two-degree field is, is a piece of optics which expands the one-degree field I use for photography into two degrees. Uh, and there we put optical fibres all over the field, corresponding to the positions of galaxies on the sky. Those optical fibres feed spectrographs so we can analyse the light in great detail and derive the redshifts of the galaxies, which in turn tell us their distance. And that enables us to make a three-dimensional map of the universe. This is a very complicated device indeed. It's the most complicated thing seen on a ground-based telescope. These pictures taken by Francisco Diego show it at a very early stage of, of its development. Now it's working extremely well. We're building maps of the universe out to enormous uh, redshifts. And it's, a, it's a, a world first. Nobody's got anything like this on any telescope anywhere else. Well, the AAT is a fine telescope, but uh, there are bigger ones now. Aren't there? Many observers are planning eight-metre telescopes. Yes, Have the course. AAT and APMI plans for that? Yes, of course. The, the two-degree field is, um, uh, is a way, in, in fact, to use a four-metre telescope rather well, but eight-metre telescopes have enormous advantages. They collect much more light, for example. Australia has a great interest uh, in having access to 8-metre telescopes. There were discussions with ESO, uh, which hadn't worked too well. We're now going towards Gemini, looking towards the uh, telescopes that the British are involved in. Two t uh, a telescope in either hemisphere, one in Hawaii, one in Chile for the southern hemisphere. Negotiations are continuing, but it's essential that Australian astronomers have access to these new modern instruments. Will you be using these yourself? I'd love to. I very much hope you do. David, thank you very much. It's a marvellous exhibition. Thank you. Now, don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our information line, 0891 or CFAX, page 620. And when I come back next month, we're going to turn to the sun. And the sun is waking up after solar minimum. The spots are coming back. And here's a Douglas Arnold picture of the sunspot group. And look at this one. We had a face on Mars. What about a dog on the sun? And also, prominences. And here again are Douglas Arnold pictures of recent prominences. You see how they shift and change. But the reason I'm, I'm talking about the sun is because at the end of this month, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. Unfortunately, not seen from here. We've got to wait until the 11th of August, 1999. But believe me, a total eclipse is a wonderful sight. Here's a picture I took of an eclipse some time ago. And this one, taken at the 1995 eclipse by Chris Doherty. You see there the corona beautifully. Well, the eclipse at the end of this month is going to be visible from the Caribbean area, and that's where I hope to be. So, given clear skies, I hope next month to be able to show you pictures of a total eclipse of the sun. So until then, good night.